We're beginning our final unit of grade 11 advanced chemistry, organic chemistry. This is not a topic for the AP chemistry exam, but it's a topic that we need to cover for our provincial curriculum. The focus here is going to be on nomenclature primarily, so learning how to name organic molecules and learning how to draw molecules when we're given the names. We'll also look at a few organic uh, reactions and we'll use the unit as a way to review some old material. Pause the video as you need to take notes. So the first thing um, we'll look at in this unit is are the alkanes. These are a group of organic molecules that are sometimes called saturated hydrocarbons. Earlier in our course, we talked about hydrocarbon combustion as a type of reaction. There are many different kinds of hydrocarbons. The alkanes are, are the first group we're going to look at. So we know that these are molecules made of carbon with hydrogen. A really, really important point that you really want to emphasize is that carbon atoms in all these organic molecules are going to always want to form four chemical bonds. Right? So carbon needs to have four bonds. They can be four single bonds, they can be double bonds, they can be triple bonds, but each carbon atom needs to have a total of four bonds. We call the alkanes saturated hydrocarbons because they have the maximum number of hydrogen atoms that the molecule can possibly hold. The reason they have the maximum amount of hydrogen is because all of the carbon-carbon bonds in an alkane are single bonds. So there will be no double bonds between carbon atoms, there will be no triple bonds between carbon atoms, only single bonds. When you have that, and you have only carbons and hydrogens, you'll have the maximum amount of hydrogen possible, and so we call you a saturated alkane. So saturated hydrocarbon, rather. And these are also known as alkanes. There are several ways to represent these molecules, not just alkanes, but organic molecules in general. You don't need to sketch these in your notes, but just be familiar with their, with their names. So on the far left, you see the expanded formulas. We're, we're not going to draw those very often, but you can see in that far left molecule that every bond between carbon atoms is just a single bond. And, and then there's hydrogens to complete them. So therefore, this would be an alkane. If you count how many, carb how many bonds each carbon atom has, you'll see that they always end up having four bonds. So for example, if I circle this carbon atom down here, it's got one, two, three, four bonds around it. So that carbon atom has the four bonds that we mentioned. Often, more often than drawing expanded formulas, much more often, we'll draw condensed formulas. Um, in the condensed formula, instead of showing the individual hydrogen atoms, we'll group them together. So if a carbon has three hydrogens attached, we'll write CH3. If it has one hydrogen attached, we'll write CH. Um, this particular example of a condensed formula suggests, incorrectly, that the bonds are all sort of linear or 90 degree angles. That's not accurate. If you look at the ball and stick model, which represents carbon atoms as black spheres, and then for some weird reason they chose blue spheres for hydrogens, almost always hydrogen would be represented with a white sphere, so not these little blue spheres. But you can see this is the same molecule that we saw in the other two representations. Um, but you notice that the bond angles are, are sort of jagged. There's a bond angle, not 90 degree angle, but 109.5 degrees because that's a tetrahedral angle. So every bond angle, when carbon has four bonds to it, is 109.5 degrees, and we refer to that as a tetrahedral angle. If you look at um, this carbon atom at the bottom here with an, with an arrow pointing at it, you can see that that carbon atom has four things attached. The three blue hydrogens are sort of coming towards you, and then it's bonded to a carbon atom going away from you. You can imagine that that's a tetrahedron with the carbon atom at its center. So the bond angles are referred to as tetrahedral. Make sure you know that. 
And on, on average, because the, the molecules do bend and twist and turn, but on average, there'll be 109.5 degree angles. We're not going to get out protractors to when we draw the molecules, but we will usually draw the molecules in a sort of zigzaggy pattern to represent that. So you can see what, I'm, what I was just referring to here. Look at how these molecules are condensed formulas, but not in a straight line, but in that zigzaggy pattern. Each angle there would be the 109.5 degree tetrahedral angle. So normal versus branched alkanes. This is a really fundamental idea. So a normal alkane is an alkane where there's just a continuous chain of carbon atoms. The first molecule you see there has one, two, three, four, five carbons just bonded together in, in, a, in a row, in a, in, a, in a chain. So that's a continuous chain of carbon atoms. That first molecule is a normal alkane. Okay. Sometimes you don't have five carbons like that just in a row. You have what we see in the second molecule. We have four carbon atoms in a row. One, two, three, four carbon atoms. That would be a chain of four atoms. And then there's a fifth carbon atom, which is branching off of the chain. So that's called a branched alkane. So the one at the bottom is the branch, and the four in a row would be referred to, as we'll see in a moment, as the parent chain. Okay, the parent chain is the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms in the molecule. You might have been able to draw the parent chain in more than one way, or, or to label it in more than one way. Instead of one, two, three, four, as I've done there, I could have numbered it one, two, three, four, like that. And then this fifth carbon over here would be a branch. So there may be more than one way to identify the parent chain, but it's the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms in the molecule. All right, so there's the purple circles highlighting the parent chain in that second way of looking at it, and then the green circle highlighting the branch. All right, so those two molecules we just saw were, I don't know if you noticed, but they have the same chemical formulas. They were both five carbon hydrocarbons. And if you counted their hydrogens, they each had 12 hydrogens. So their formulas were the same. The first one was normal pentane is its, is its proper name. The second one's name is methyl butane, and you're gonna be able to, to name that pretty soon yourself. But those are different molecules, even though they have the same chemical formulas. So that's what we mean here by the term structural isomers, isomerism. Structural isomers, molecules that have the same chemical formula, same molecular formula, so C5H12, but they're connected in different ways. They have different connectivities. It's as though I gave you um, let's see, five black Lego pieces and 12 white Lego pieces and said, build me something. One student built one structure. Another student, using exactly the same pieces, built something different. So they would have structural isomers. They have the same pieces, but they're connected in different ways. All right, so we're going to see that there are often very many ways you can um, connect the atoms in a, in a hydrocarbon, so the same formula can have a whole bunch of different possible molecules. Structural isomers are also sometimes called constitutional isomers, but I'm going to use more often the phrase structural isomer, so make sure you uh, focus on that phrase. The first 10 normal alkanes, you don't need to copy all of this down, but the names and formulas, you should write those down. So the first 10 names, you just need to know. The first four, there's really no rhyme or reason to their names. You just have to memorize them. So a hydrocarbon, a normal hydrocarbon alkane with just one carbon is referred to as methane. When the normal alkane, again, remember normal means no branches, so normal with two carbons is ethane, 
three carbons is propane and four carbons is butane. So you just need to memorize those first four, methane, ethane, propane, butane, one, two, three, four carbons in a, in a normal chain, in a straight chain. Then after the fourth one, the names become more logical, more easily memorized, because they use the same prefixes that we've seen before. If you have five carbons in the alkane, we'll refer to that as pentane, six carbons, hexane, and then all the way down to decane. So make sure you have the first ten names written down and their formulas. Now, do you see a pattern in the formulas. You can pause the video if you want to take time to write that down. Do you see a pattern in these formulas? Okay, so for example, if I asked you to predict the, the next uh, normal alkane with 11 carbons, I think most people would easily predict C11H24. But suppose I wanted you to give me the formula of an alkane with with let's say 20 carbons, right? So if it has 20 carbons, how many hydrogens would it have? If it had 36 carbons, how many hydrogens would it have? Can you see what the answers are? Pause the video and see if you can predict that. So did you predict that there would be 42 hydrogens? And did you predict that there would be 74 hydrogens in the second one. There's a simple pattern to every one of these formulas. If you have an alkane, only single bonds and only carbons and hydrogens, then the formula, the general formula, is CnH2n plus 2. In other words, if you have n carbons in your alkane, you'll have 2 times that plus 2 hydrogens. So if you had 20 carbons, 2 times 20 is 40, plus 2, you have 42 hydrogens. If you have 36 carbons, 2 times 36 is 72, plus 2 more is 74 hydrogens. So that general formula for an alkane, make sure you know that. Make sure you've written that down. Call it the general formula of a normal of an alkane it doesn't have to be normal by the way these 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 hydrocarbons can have lots of branches in them if they're alkanes if they have only single carbon carbon bonds this will be the general formula whether they're normal or branched it doesn't matter now i told you you don't have to write down any of the other information here but there is some other interesting stuff Look at the number of structural isomers, the number of ways of building molecules with that same formula. Not surprisingly, when you're a smaller molecule, like methane, ethane, propane, there's only one way you can build a molecule with two carbons and six hydrogens, or three carbons and eight hydrogens. You can only build those in one way, where every carbon is bonded to another carbon with a single bond, and where every carbon has four bonds total. But when you start getting to more complex formulas, the number of structural, structural isomers increases pretty rapidly. So by the time you get to decane, C10H22, there are actually 75 different molecules with different names that have that same formula. The one that is just 10 carbons in a row with no branchings to it, that would be referred to as normal decane or just decane sometimes. Um, and then there'd be a whole bunch of other possible molecules where there's varying branches, different numbers of branches, different sized branches, and there'd be 75 molecules total with that formula. So knowing a chemical formula when you have a large number of carbons really doesn't tell you what the molecular structure is. It doesn't, doesn't identify specifically which compound you have. Um, if you know you have a, a formula of C10H22, well, there could be 75 different substances with that same formula. Next, take a look at the melting and boiling points, and you'll notice something interesting there. 
So all of these are hydrocarbons, which means they're all nonpolar molecules. There are only carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, and these are all nonpolar bonds. So hydrocarbons are always going to be just nonpolar molecules. So the only intermolecular force that's, that's present would be London dispersion forces. When you get to be larger molecules, there's a larger cloud of electrons around the molecules, so they're more polarizable, and their London dispersion forces get stronger. So as you look at those boiling points and melting points, you'll notice that at room temperature, the first four um, normal alkanes are all going to be gases, right? So they're all gases, methane, ethane, propane, butane. Their boiling points are below uh, room temperature. But when you get to the, the next group, look at their melting points and then look at their boiling points. And you'll notice that that next group, they're liquids all the way up to 16 carbons. In fact, they'll be liquids at room temperature. So if they're liquids rather than gases, they must have stronger intramolecular forces, which makes sense because they're larger molecules. And as we just said, they're more polarizable and their London dispersion forces are stronger. When you get past 16 carbons, if you have a hydrocarbon with 36 carbons in it, then that's going to be a solid at room temperature. So UPAC has given us a systematic way of naming alkanes when there are branches present. So these rules are important to learn. We're going to use similar rules for a whole bunch of other kinds of organic molecules. So pay close attention to this first set of rules. So when you're given a hydrocarbon, not just a formula, but you're looking at the actual structure of the molecule in front of you, the first thing you'll want to do to name it is to find and name the longest continuous chain of carbons in the molecule. You're going to try to find and name the parent chain. So when I say name it, if it had six carbons in the parent chain, then you'd name that hexane. If it had eight carbons, you'd name that octane, the names that we just wrote down earlier. This name of the parent chain will form the root of the name of the entire molecule. Next, we're going to number the carbon atoms in the parent chain. So if it had six carbons, we're going to number them one to six. Usually, we do that just in our heads. We don't physically write down the numbers on the paper. Usually, we're just doing that in our head. Now, there's two ends to the chain. So which end should you number from? The answer is you number in a way that keeps the numbers smallest. And to do that, number from the end closest to the branches. So if there's a branch on the third carbon from the left side and another branch on the second carbon from the right side, then you would start numbering from the right side when you're numbering the parent chain. You number from the end of the parent chain closest to a branch. Next is to name the branches that are present in the molecule. So after identifying the parent chain, you'll then see that there are branches attached to it. When we're naming the branches, we change the ending of the names. So if there was a one carbon branch, if you think back to your earlier notes, when there is one carbon, we called that methane. But if it's a branch, we're going to call it methyl. So we drop the A-N-E from methane, and we add Y-L and call it methyl. If there's a two-carbon branch, then two carbons would normally be called ethane, so that's going to now be called an ethyl branch. A three-carbon branch would be a propyl branch. A four-carbon branch is a butyl branch, etc. You don't see often really long branches, because to have a really long branch, you'd have to have an extraordinarily long parent chain. Because remember, the parent chain is the longest continuous chain in the, in the molecule. So usually, branches are one carbon long, two carbons long, sometimes three. You don't see very many examples of longer branches than that. 
if there are more than one type of branch in the molecule, so maybe the molecule has a methyl branch and it also has an ethyl branch, then when you're naming your molecule, you put those, the names of the branches alphabetically. So the ethyl branch would get named before the methyl branch when you're naming the molecule because E comes before M. So when you're naming the molecule and it has more than one kind of branch, put the names of the branches alphabetically in the name of the molecule. Sometimes there'll be more than one methyl branch or more than one ethyl branch. In that case, we have to add prefixes. So if there were two methyl branches in the molecule, then you'd say dimethyl. If there were three ethyl branches, you'd say triethyl. Now, if you're putting prefixes, keep one thing in mind, that when you're naming the branches alphabetically, you ignore their prefixes. So when you're alphabetizing the branches to decide which branch gets named first in the molecule, you focus on the methyl, the ethyl. You don't focus on the prefixes like di or tri. Pause the video if you need to to continue writing that down. So here's a simple example of, a, out of an alkane with branches on it. Look at that name and write it down, 2 comma 2, and, and focus also on the use of punctuation, 2 comma 2 dash dimethylpentane. Notice dimethylpentane is just one word, okay? But it has a 2 comma 2 in front of it and then a dash as well. All right, so what exactly does that name mean? So the parent chain in that molecule is the root. So I look at the end of the, of the name and I see pentane. So this molecule has a parent chain with five carbons, right? Pentane had five carbons in it. So in my, on my paper, I might start by writing that down. When I do it myself, I would, just, I would not put all the hydrogens on at this point. I would just put five carbons, one, two, three, four, five, in a zigzaggy pattern like that. Remember the tetrahedral bond angles. So five carbons in a row. Again, I would not personally add hydrogens at this point. The dimethyl up in the name tells me that this molecule has two methyl branches somewhere on the parent chain. A methyl branch is a branch with only one carbon. So there are two branches on this parent chain, and the branches each have one carbon. So they're dimethyl. But where are they? Where are the branches? Notice that you can never put a branch on the end carbon atoms on either end. If you put a branch on the end of the chain, it's no longer a branch. You've simply taken the parent chain and make it, made it longer. So branches will never be on the end um, carbon atoms. Also, if a branch had two carbons in it, so suppose you're talking about an ethyl branch, then the ethyl branch, because it has two carbons, not only can it not be on the end carbon on either end, it could not also be on the second carbon from either end. If the branch had two carbons and you put it, let me just draw that here. If you put a branch with two carbons on the second carbon from the right, the parent chain is no longer five carbons. Now the parent chain would be one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So that is now a hexane rather than a pentane. So you're not allowed to put branches ever on the first carbon from either end. And if it's got two carbons in the branch, you can't put it on the first or second carbon from either end of the parent chain. If it had three carbons in the branch, you couldn't put it on the first, second, or third carbons from either end. Because in each case, you would simply be making the parent chain longer, and you would no longer be talking about a branch. Okay? All right. So what does the 2 comma 2 up in the name tell me? Well, the 2 comma 2 is telling me where to put those two methyl branches in the parent chain. 
So we're going to go to the second carbon in the parent chain, and we can number them from either way at this point. So we can number from right to left, we can number from left to right in the, in the parent chain, but on the second carbon, in whichever way we numbered, we're going to put both of the methyl branches. 2 comma 2 is telling us both branches are on that same carbon, the second carbon in the parent chain. So when you actually look at the molecule, that's what you'll get. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 carbons, there's pentane. And on the second carbon in the parent chain, there's a methyl branch and another methyl branch. That's 2 comma 2 dimethyl pentane. Now look at each carbon, and can you rationalize why they have the number of hydrogen atoms that you see? Why do some of those carbons have three hydrogens? Why do some of them have two? Why does one of them have none? Why is that? Well, remember, each carbon needs to have four bonds total. So if you're a carbon like carbon number one, the only bond it had was to the other carbon atom. So it has a bond connecting it to the next carbon. Therefore, it needed three other bonds. So because it needs three other bonds, we give it three hydrogen atoms. Same thing with the carbon up above, the two methyl branches, the one above and below, they each had only one bond, so therefore they get three hydrogen atoms so that the carbons have four bonds total. Carbon number three and carbon number four, they each had two bonds already, so because they had two bonds each to other carbon atoms, they each got two hydrogen atoms to give them their four bonds total. Carbon number two had four bonds. It's got four bonds to four other carbon atoms. So carbon number two already had four bonds. It doesn't get any hydrogen atoms attached. So that's how we decide how many hydrogens in order to give every carbon the four bonds that it needed. All right, why don't you see if you can apply what we just did to this slightly more complicated looking name and draw it. Can you pause the video and see if you can draw this molecule? Right, so the focus at the beginning should be at the end of the name, heptane. Hept means seven, so this parent chain has seven carbon atoms. So you just got to draw seven carbons in a zigzaggy pattern. Again, I, would, I wouldn't draw hydrogens in at this point because we're going to attach the branches. So just draw seven carbons in a row. Notice that in this case, I, I sort of went one, two, three, four, five, and then I went down and across. The molecule is totally twistable and bendable. It's just that there's seven in a row. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons connected in a chain. That's heptane. Okay. If I drew it, if I had drawn the sixth carbon up here and a seventh over here, so it just looks like it goes left to right, that's the same molecule, just twisted and turned a little bit differently. Okay. So how you draw it, whether it goes up or down or left or right, these molecules are fully twistable and bendable. That's not what's, that's not what's important. All right, so looking back at the name, notice that there's an ethyl branch and then there are methyl branches. And because the, alf the ethyl is alphabetically before methyl, the name has ethyl first. When we alphabetize, we do not look at the prefix di, we look at the, the branch name methyl. So methyl comes after ethyl in the name. But there's dimethyl, so that means there's two methyl branches. There's only ethyl, so therefore there's only one ethyl branch. The numbers are telling us where those branches are in the parent chain. So if you numbered the chain like I've done here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, then on carbon number 3, you're going to place a 2-carbon ethyl branch. And on carbon 2 and on carbon 4, you're going to place 1-carbon methyl branches. All right? So there's the numbering, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
2,4-dimethyl. There are two methyl branches on carbons 2 and 4. And 3-ethyl, there's an ethyl branch which has two carbons on the third carbon of the parent chain. So that's something like what you should have drawn. When you look at that molecule, look at the carbons and hydrogen atoms. Make sure you understand why each carbon has the number of hydrogens that you see. It's based on the number of bonds. The total number of bonds must be four. So if you look at the carbon I've just highlighted, that carbon had three bonds to other carbons, so it needs one more bond. It gets one hydrogen atom. If you look at this carbon that I've just highlighted, it had two bonds to other carbon atoms, so it needs two more bonds. We give it two hydrogen atoms. Okay? Carbons that are terminal, carbons that are at the end of a chain or the end of a branch, they'll always get three hydrogens because if they're terminal, they'll have only one bond. All right? One last example. See if you can draw that one. 233-trimethyl-4-propyl-octane. Pause the video. So notice again the use of punctuation, the numbers, the dashes, the commas. Make sure you're following that protocol. Notice the propyl octane is just one word. Methyl and propyl are the two kinds of branches. Methyl comes before propyl alphabetically, so methyl was put first in the name. Trimethyl has a T, but when we're alphabetizing, we don't look at the prefixes like that. So when you look at that name, as ugly as it is, are you able now to sort of decipher what it means? Octane. So there is an eight carbon parent chain. There's eight carbons connected to each other. Now what I'm showing you here is referred to as a bond line formula. A bond line formula. The vertices, wherever I'm putting a dot here, these vertices are understood to be carbon atoms and they're understood to have hydrogens attached. So we don't show the carbon atoms and we don't show the hydrogen atoms. We just draw that. We don't even put those little red dots. We just draw what you saw earlier. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight carbons. Now when you number, I've numbered from left to right, but you didn't have to. You could have numbered the opposite way, one to eight. It would be the same thing, just flipped over, right? So when you're numbering, maybe make, mix it up. Sometimes number from left to right, sometimes number from right to left, just to mix it up. So the 233-trimethyl, this is telling us three methyl branches are in this molecule, and the 233 means one of them is on carbon 2, and the other two of those methyl branches are on carbon 3. The 4-propyl Propyl comes from propane, which was the three-carbon hydrocarbon. So this is a three-carbon branch. For propyl, it's on the fourth carbon in the chain. So therefore, adding those branches, that's what you would get if you drew the bond line formula. This is how I'm usually going to draw the molecules, so you should get used to seeing this and drawing them yourselves. They're a little bit more economical than drawing all the carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms. But when you look at this molecule, make sure you understand what it's saying. This vertex that I've just highlighted is actually a carbon atom. And since it has only one bond to it right now, it must have three hydrogens. This vertex that I've just highlighted is another carbon atom. It has two bonds, so it must have two hydrogen atoms right? This carbon atom that I've just highlighted is a, that's a carbon, and it has three bonds, so it must have one hydrogen atom. So when you're looking at the bond line formula, be sure you understand each vertex is a carbon atom. There's another one, carbon, and you can deduce the number of hydrogens by looking how many bonds there are. That last carbon I highlighted has four bonds already, 
um, so it has no hydrogens attached. All right. So what would be the actual chemical formula for this hydrocarbon? Can you figure out its formula? Well, I can pretty easily. I look at the parent name, and octane was eight carbons. Propyl meant a three-carbon branch. Trimethyl is three times a one-carbon branch. So this hydrocarbon has eight plus three plus three. It's got 14 carbon atoms, so C14. And you remember the general formula of an alkane. It must be H30, two times 14 plus two. So C14H30, I can tell that by looking at the name. I can tell it by looking at the molecular formula in front of me. I can figure out the, the molecular formula of the, of the alkane. All right, so just highlighting there. So that's, that is what the bond line formula is showing. The carbons and hydrogens are just understood to be there. All right, can we go the other way around? Pause the video and draw that molecule. Now that you've drawn it, can we figure out what its name is? Well, the first thing when we're naming is to identify the parent chain. So the longest continuous chain is five carbons. So there's five carbons, but which end should I number from? So should I number it as one, two, three, four, five, like that? Or should I go the other way, the backwards? Remember that we number the parent chain from the end closest to branches. So if I'm going to number from the end closest to branches, then this carbon at the end would be number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. That way there's a branch coming off of carbon two, and another branch coming off of carbon three. If I had numbered in the other way, from left to right, then the branches would have been on carbons three and four. So you want to end. You want to number in a way that keeps those numbers smallest, and that's to number from the end closest to the branches. So we have two methyl branches. The branches each have one carbon in them, and they're on carbons two and three. So what should the name of this molecule be? Well, 2,3-dimethyl, and again, look at the comma, look at the dash, dimethyl, because there's two methyl branches, and pentane, because the parent chain had five carbons. Try that one, and we'll end with this one in this video. So start by finding the parent chain. Once you've found the parent chain, decide if you should number it from the left side or from the right side, keeping in mind you want to keep the number smallest, you want a number from the end closest to branches. So here the parent chain had eight carbon atoms, so octane, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's the eight carbons in the parent chain. Now should I number it from the left to the right or should I number it from the right to the left? Well, if I go from the left to the right, there would be branches on the third, fourth, and fifth carbons. If I number from the right to the left, the branches would be on the fourth, fifth, and sixth carbons. So because numbering from the left creates smaller branch numbers, that's how we're going to number. So two methyl branches counting from the left, they're on carbon three and carbon four. And then carbon five has a two carbon branch and that's referred to as ethyl. So now we're ready to put the name together, but ethyl and methyl, which one should we name first in the, in the name? You go alphabetically. So we're gonna name ethyl before the methyl. So here we go, the name would be five ethyl, so carbon 5 has the 2-carbon branch, ethyl. And then 3,4-dimethyl. And look how I'm using dashes. Look how I'm using commas. 3,4-dimethyl. And then the parent chain, octane. 5-ethyl, 3,4-dimethyl, octane. 
as crazy as these names are, they are systematic. When you see this ugly name, you could draw the molecule because the name is so clearly telling you how it's actually constructed. So to give you that clarity of how the molecule is built, the names have to be somewhat uh, unwieldy. These are not simple names. But once you understand the rules for naming them, they actually make a lot of sense. They're logical. So why don't we stop there in this first video lesson on alkane nomenclature.